Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is the first of um, a series of events happening this term um, as part of the newly formed community cluster. And if you want to know a little bit more about what exactly that is, um, this week's Fulcrum, which is a school publication, is all about it. So you can take one of those when you leave. But essentially, it's a platform for people within the school community who sort of want to engage in a more um, socially involved type of architecture. So I'll leave it to Alex to introduce Andreas. Um, well, I think you're going to say most of it yourself, but um, Tin is Andreas and Yashar, which is not, which is not here today. Uh, they started as students at my university in Norway, NTNU, and have done projects in Thailand all over the place. So it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Oh. You don't you want it. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm Andreas. Did you hear that, the first part? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank uh, Alex, uh, Clem, and Sophie for inviting me. This is uh, really a really great initiative, and I think you should pay attention to what these guys are doing. It's uh, interesting stuff. Um, and it's very good to be here. I hope you will enjoy parts of my story, at least. I have to go back quite far. And uh, this is a project we did as students in our third year. Uh, we won a competition uh, re refurbishing a student house we have in um, my hometown, Trondheim, in Norway. And we, it was a very interesting project because we were working with 70 students. They were running around doing whatever we tried to design and we learned very much through this project about how to actually achieve the designs you're doing. Uh, the problematic thing for us was that we spent close to uh, 150,000 British pounds on a space where students get more drunk. And there was something that didn't really fit with the feeling of the value of an architect. It didn't ring sort of like a, a, in a good way in our ears. And in this kind of, uh, as, a, as a kind of a reaction to this, we wanted to do something different. Uh, at the time, we, we were quite restless and we found for some reason, I, I really don't know, we figured out we, we wanted to buy a boat and live in that. Um, so we bought this boat. It's, it's made in 1906, and it was the boat that went for a hotel in Tyn, which is a part of Norway, mountainous region, and, uh, and the lake is also called Tyn. Uh, I think this picture is actually from the last king's coronation, no, the two kings ago. Coronation. So it's a really old boat with a lot of history. And we, we lived in this boat for a full year, uh, talking about architecture, the true meaning of what is architecture for, for, for us and what can we do, what can we achieve with these skills we are presented with. And of course, the, the feeling of staying in this boat is quite special. It's a very cramped area. Uh, you have to know that the things you bring into the boat, they will take up space, and you don't bring too of the same thing. We had to choose between having a water kettle or a water boiler. We couldn't have both. And this sort of slow life out of, it wasn't really comfortable, but it was really inspiring. And also, we had the really good talks about architecture in this boat. And then we, we, we found this um, comic strip. It's made by uh, Wolf Morgenthaler. It's a Danish duo. And we, we, we felt. When we bought the boat, we felt like we were in, the, in square three. What is interesting about square three is that sometimes you get this burst of energy. It's like, damn it, this is not good in a way. And, and you sort of really want to get out of it. But in square four, you're back in the normal, I'm a seagull, let's fly around kind of mood. And that happens every time, and it's a cycle. We wanted to stay in square three, and, and that's quite difficult in Norway, because it's probably one of the most comfortable countries in the world, except the cold. Um, so we figured out, let's leave. We went 
to the complete opposite of Norway. We went to a small village on the border of Burma, in the middle of Thailand. Um, this is the village. About 2,000 people live here. They have almost no, no identification papers. They're illegally settled on this side of, of uh, Thailand. So this is Thailand, and the top part is Burma. <coughs> And it was quite interesting because we were thrown into this social life in the village. And these were people we'd never met before. And our, the guy in the front of the, in the picture, he's our future interpreter. And the guy cutting the meat is our carpenter. And the guy standing behind there is our team leader. And we didn't know that. And we couldn't, we couldn't understand this village without staying there for the, the amount of time we actually did. And that became a very important part of our, our work in the future. What we also saw is that you come to a place where you don't have uh, big machines and tools to fix everything for you. You can't use the laser cutter. You can't, you can't buy ready-made stuff. And if you have a big boulder, you have to move it yourself. And with cooperation and communication and uh, brute force, you can actually move quite big stones. But it also affected the way we thought about what we design. Because why do we have to move the stone in the first place? It's because we have an idea of the plan should be this way or this way. And suddenly, our drawings became physical labor for someone else. And of course, it should affect the design, not the opposite way. We also have had uh, a quite different way. In, in Norway, we have a lot of regulations. I'm sure you're familiar with the amount of regulations you have to deal with as an architect. In this area, you have sort of a different approach to the whole thing. Um, there is a military group there that uh, it protects the forest from, uh, is it called poaching for trees? Um, and they actually came there with guns, and we walked around on the site with them and uh, bought them some sodas and some gasoline. And then we pointed at where we wanted to build and said, it's going to be this high and this wide. And the leader sort of nodded pointed on the map and said, don't, don't build over there. This is OK. And then you just left. And that was the whole application. Yeah, by the way, that's my colleague Yashar in the background, uh, sort of scared looking <laughs> fella. Also, the design was really affected by working in this area. Because uh, as you might know, we communicate through drawings and, and uh, mm. illustrations. In this area, that didn't really work, because they'd never seen a plan before. And um, we couldn't speak the language, so this is, this is a stair we built, and uh, our carpenter, we wanted the stair to sort of lead people into the, into the, towards the site in a way, this way. And we said, um, okay, make the first step a little bit like this, and then the next uh, a little bit more. But when we came back and it built two steps, it was almost turning all the way around. So we said, no, 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 not that much, it should be a little bit back. And then we were back to the straight path again, so we were sort of back to square one. Uh, so we're like, uh, well, it sort of looks kind of nice. Maybe we should just do it. Let, let's let this thing be what one of our mentors, Samir Intala, calls a beautiful mistake. So we just did it in, just in the extreme for the next three or four steps. And basically, the shape of the design didn't come from our ideas. It became something we discovered as we went step by step, quite literally. And also, as I said, when you don't have big machines and cranes, the way you assemble the building should be in a logical way. The length of wood was limited by, by the age of the tree, because if the tree was old, the, the bugs would eat too much of the core, and you couldn't use it as, as con construction timber. So the length of each piece of wood is three meters, and that was all we got. We also had a you get these gut reactions to your design when, you, when you're in this situation. We wanted to do this um, bamboo cladding, and we wanted to do it sort of like uh, the Norwegian style, which would be sort of a t timber log housing. And uh, of course, it failed miserably. And after two days, the whole thing started to crumble. And uh, our main carpenter came to us and just punched his hand through the wall and said, this is crap. Um, can I show you how to do it with my, the, the thing for my machete? I can, I can do the same on the wall. And of course, 
that was the first time we realized that these people can give to us solutions to our problems instead of us sort of trying to figure out what is actually not our task to solve. What was interesting is that 20, the next day, 20 guys were chopping bamboo, and we actually clad all the six houses we made this time in four days with less material than we would have used. And it takes a lot more. It, it has in, it strength in its own. And it was really a feeling of being um, not good enough as an architect. I didn't know enough to be able to solve the thing I should solve. So this is the team we worked with in the first, first project, the butterfly houses. Of course, they, in a way, they do build the project. And even though we have a design, we have done so many choices because of how we met these people. And these are the finished houses. Uh, we built this through in the fall of 2008 and I finished in the start of 2009. It's basic stuff. It's small units to keep cross-ventilating uh, cross the houses, lifting the wood from the soil, for keeping it from rotting. Um, as you see, the bracing is really visible so they can see that the triangles is the thing that makes this structure solid. Another th funny thing about working in, uh, in this area is that you can't really know if the wood is of a high, this and this quality. You get it from the forest next to the site. Um, and we called back to our university at the time and asked, how do we calculate if this is safe enough? And then they said, well, put 10 people on the roof and let the rest of the workers shake the house. If it falls down, you should do it thicker. If it doesn't, it's OK. So I took me and 10 workers were sitting on top of the roof. And then the other one, other team was shaking the house. And it moved a bit, but it, it was still standing. And even the workers apparently saw that, wow, you can actually put these big structures on really small pieces of metal. What we've seen through our experience in Thailand is that very small opportunities can lead to very big uh, consequences. We, we were visiting this uh, border town near Thailand, no, near the, the village we were working on, in. And once in this restaurant, we saw a small piece of paper hanging on the wall. It said, hello, I'm running an orphanage. I need help. If you're an English teacher, math teacher, come visit us and we would love to have volunteers. So we traveled around all, the, all of the area and then finally we found Tasani. She was living two, one and a half hours north of the first project and she had 50 kids. Uh, and then also being, we'd been in the jungle, three people for four months and we're sort of getting sick of being alone. and. Uh, confused, so we invited 12 of our friends from school to come do a workshop in this uh, orphanage. We also invited Samir Intala, the Finnish Norwegian architect. And what is interesting is that when you bring other professionals into your work, you, you get an input from, from them that will relate to what you're trying to do. And he's a very pragmatic kind of architect. He's like, okay, wind is here, sun is here. Well, it's obvious, let's put the building like this. It's not like he, he doesn't feel too much about it should be this and this kind of shape. So he just walked to Tassani and said, where's your site? Where's the wind? Where's the sun? Uh, how are you going to use the building? And then the basic concept was already there. We didn't really have to shape anything. So this is the sketch we, built, uh, we made before building the project. It's very basic. It's a, Heavy structure towards the rain and windy side, and then it's open towards the river. And then it's a two-story building. Two, sort of a combination. It's, it's colder in the, first, in the bottom floor, and then the top floor can be used in the evenings for reading and sleeping and things like this. And of course, he's, the, some of is also funny because he, he we were standing on the site, and some, one of the students said, like, OK, we have a design. Now what? And then he just says, well, there's a hell of a lot of stone here. Let's start there. 
So we just basically took the volcanic stone that we found on site and just made a bed of rocks and then had a small layer of concrete on top. And then it's a brick wall in the background. A wooden framing in the front to keep the sun out. And then a very open facade uh, made by bamboo. So this was made in 12 days, design and building. Which is interesting because uh, this project won the Building of the Year Awards in Art Daily over Saha Hadid and Toyo Ito. And that made it significant in a sense that we didn't even dream of because you can do in 12 days something that inspires so many people and it's used by hundreds of people in the area every day. And this is one week after the finished building was up. Already you have a, a maps and a computer and books. <coughs> When we were doing this, me and Yasha was mainly organizing stuff and we, we sort of had extra resources to do, I guess, the creative part of architecture. So we wanted to build a bathhouse for Tassani and her kids. That was the two functions she wanted, education and uh, a better sanitary building. And they already had this timber frame that one NGO had set up. You see the dark wood in the background. And then we, we thought, well, we should use it when we have it. We don't have time to really build anything more. I don't think that's mine. Is it? Okay. Sorry. Uh, what is bad is that a lot of places where um, the resources are limited, there are images of the sort of the American style or the Western style of life, which is sort of tile, white tiles and golden faucets. And as you see, it doesn't really work. This area is, is requires diff a different design approach. And what is important for us is that to show it is possible to do this in a beautiful way with local materials. So this is our solution to the same kind of problem. You have a Use tire as the, the rubber in the tire is quite easy to clean. The gravel could be exchanged. So the whole thing is just a reservoir of water. You just pour whatever water you need to wash and then it just runs away. And then you have a pipe we found next to the road which is this ready-made pipe for uh, road work. And also blue piping from the uh, normal hardware store in the area. So this is uh, the front of the bathhouse. Basically, uh, the yellow building is uh, two toilets, and the red one is a washing machine and a shower. And then also, we have uh, urinals for different age groups. This one didn't really work, because the goats really love the smell of it, so they, they tore down the whole thing in less than two weeks. So goats are also a challenge you don't usually get in Europe. Then it's basically a sort of a hallway that you can pass through the whole building. And then the bathroom. The, the, the ba bathing is quite social in, in the local community and being together when you bathe is quite normal and part of the social life. And of course it's very inspiring to see when you design something and build it in 10 days, 12 days, and then you see they start using it. Uh, your drawings have real value for real people. It's not some dream architecture that you make up in your mind and hope will work someday. So that was the first three projects we did in Thailand and now we've spent six months in the jungle and we're sort of uh, missing internet and uh, showers and toilets and these normal things and we wanted to also seek out uh, urban challenge because rural situations have a different kind of resistance in them and of course the urban development now is is quite extreme 
and the amount of what we would call urban poor is rising really fast in Thailand. It's a big sort of a lower middle class, which is big and very poor. So we packed our stuff in our pickup and uh, drove to Bangkok. And there we met uh, Ploy. Ploy is the Thai architect standing in the pink t-shirt. And she introduced us to community participatory planning. And we hadn't really thought about involving the people we worked for more than like what do you need and what kind of building do you want in a way. But then suddenly we had to get in touch with people because in this community, if you come by, you are, an, as, a, as a foreigner, you're usually a person that comes with promises and then you just leave. Or you come with measuring tools and then you tear down their house, houses. So getting to know people and trying to understand how to get under their skin in a bit, in a deeper sense, it's really important. And we didn't have any, any tools for that from our university. But Ploy showed us a way to use interviewing techniques and community meetings, hanging up posters to invite the kids. Because the kids, they, they're totally unafraid of foreigners because they haven't been let down yet, but they will. And in that sense, we could invite them and involve them in design. And they could actually see that their participation ended up in something real. And for us, that's been sort of an important mantra that if you start something, you should finish it in a way there are so many promises. It's also cool to see that the kids, they go home and tell their parents. And then the next day, mom comes by. Or maybe dad comes by when it's talk about electrician stuff, because he's sort of the big guy, and he wants to take part. And I also realized through this project that our role as an architect comes in when they have given us their ideas. We're not supposed to directly translate ideas into physical uh, buildings. We should see what, what, what are the values they're looking for. It's, it's a stair. And of course, that's the, that the value of a stair is to get up. And the meaning of getting up is that you have an overview, you have private space, things that lack normally in this community. So we didn't really have a lot of time this time either, because we were going home in May, and this was like mid-February. And we knew that we can't build the whole house. It's, it's not possible. And luckily, one of the neighbors, sorry about the resolution, uh, one of the neighbors recently died and left this to the community. So this is an uh, old row of uh, Chinese marketplaces. And in this area, it, was, it used to be a really lively market. And then uh, the main market burned down in the mid-90s, I think. And most of these things are empty or just living uh, houses for people. And then, actually, we were able to get this house for free, as long as it was given to the community in the end. And of course, this was the inside of the place. And seeing potential in this, I guess it requires some goodwill or something. Um, but the fun part is, because we'd used so much time in involving people, the next day we came, they'd cleaned out everything and taking care of the good stuff and put the uh, materials in, a, in, in sort of sorting in the big ones and the good ones and the bad ones. That's quite inspiring. And we had this community meeting to, to present their ideas translated into architecture. And it was quite fun because we, we did a rendering that we showed in the meeting and then we just had asked them, it's like, we want to build this in three weeks. And everyone started laughing. That was ridiculous that they had no, they really thought we were crazy. But through really hard work, of course, and, and a lot of effort from both us and the community, we managed to build the house in, I think the whole total building period was a bit more than three weeks. And of course, we didn't really sleep much that period. So you see, you have the stair, you can get up and have sort of a, a place for your own, for the kids. Um, the wood is second hand from the area. The boxes are from an earlier exhibition that our um, architect friends had done. And the, the chandelier is actually glass bottles with added LED lighting. And it's quite interesting to work with, with this limited resource palette. 
an amount of enthusiasm amongst the people was amazing. This guy was called Mr. Leo because he was drinking Leo, the local beer. So uh, around 11, 12, we had to send him home every day because he was drunk. Uh, <laughs> he was a danger to himself and others. And he got really sad because he really wanted to help. And then the next day, he didn't drink until one or two. And then in the end, he could actually work full days without being drunk. And we saw that these, these people have resources. It's just really uh, crippling for them to not be, no one has faith in them. They don't have any opportunity to do what they can do. And it's, it's quite nice to see this transformation. Again, this is the part of the group we worked with. I'm probably forgetting a lot of details, so if you have big questions, just raise your hand and I'll try to answer. Oh, it's, it's not very, uh, it's just a very narrow strip and then you can come out in the end with a, sort of a pond with, have some, do some fishing and plants and stuff. It's also interesting uh, to, for the first time we made a project that the interior project was basically load bearing for the exterior. Because the old roof was so bad we had to support everything and it needed to be self-braced in a way. Just a small reading section. Blackboard paint on the boxes. And then outside there's a semi-shaded uh, pergola. Also working with this uh, old timber we found in the old house was quite interesting because the first reaction was that they said, why don't, why don't you buy real material for us? We want new stuff. Why, why are you using trash to build our community house? And by being really precise about how you cut and how you attach everything and, and doing it sort of like, it's like a painting. You choose how to assemble everything. For every day that went by, they saw that, wow, this is actually quite nice. And then slowly but, but slowly they started joining in 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 doing this. And through that simple thing of precision, you add value to something that's regarded as trash. And then the kids started hanging up posters with take off your shoes, no, no fighting, no swearing, no gambling. They got really a sense of ownership in this place, and I think that's why it's been successful in, in the long run, too. We have been there couple years later and it's it's still really cool because they've started copying the, the things we've done there in other houses and this part they uh, expanded themselves they wanted more space and more plants and stuff so it's quite nice we use it for backstage for shows and just gossiping or doing homework yeah so that was the project we did as students um, we went back to Norway did our masters on more or less different topics. Um, and being finished as an architect, your, your role changes if you want it or not. Suddenly you need money and you're supposed to get a job and be grown up and all this. Uh, the cool part is through the, um, the publications we did, we found uh, there was a student group that found us in, in Berlin, in Germany, and they came to us and wanted to do something similar. And suddenly we had to think, how can we give what we have experienced to other people without sort of, this is not possible to teach anyone. You have to sort of experience it. So we, uh, we, we, th we had the ongoing project in Bangkok, sort of the, the next project we had planned. Um, but we realized that German students have almost never been in a workshop before. Uh, so we really had to prepare them for both building which is quite hard, tools and all these things, how to work with wood, how to work with steel. And we also had to prepare for how we work with design, which is really fast. And you start building before you're done designing. And that can be quite frustrating and scary sometimes. So we went down and had a workshop in the, in the university in Berlin. As you see, the, the, some fingers got maimed. So. It's good to get that out of the way before you go to a slum in, in Bangkok and start working. 
So basically we did a framework for them and then they filled it with materials we might find in the slum of Bangkok. Going to a harbor area, so pallets were normal stuff, nets, um, this uh, rebar stuff and plastic tubes. It's an exhibition pavilion, so when they, the idea we make an exhibition pavilion, we go to Bangkok, we build a project, we bring back photos, and then we exhibit what we did in Bangkok in Berlin. So it's sort of like a, it's a logical s circle, I guess. It's been in use a couple of times since then. But of course, you can't prepare a, a group of students for what you can meet in the slum of Bangkok. The situation is totally different. You don't have the resources, you don't have the workshop, and everything seems quite uh, complex, difficult. We had uh, a couple of students that went to Bangkok prior to this and did uh, research, found that they really needed an upgrade in their playground. This is how the playground looked before we started. Of course, it's not very s safe areas for kids to play. They have not nowhere to sit and so on. And again, we had to walk around, talk to the leadership in the community, get in touch with people, map what materials are available. These are recycled materials from the harbor area. They sell them as uh, a way of livelihood. Again, we involve the kids and hanging out posters. It's not like it's rocket science, but it's, it's quite nice to see how, uh, how efficient it is to get people involved. So we had Thai students and we had German students. And in total, the group was close to 30 people. And we realized we can't really involve people in the building because we don't have time. Uh, so what we did was let the students walk around in the community, take notes of what uh, everyone thought about the playground and what we can do to improve it. And one of our main design tools is the whiteboard, because there's something immediate about the way you draw on the whiteboard. You can't save it without taking a picture. We almost don't have pictures of it even, because we really like the idea of drawing what you think while you draw it in a way. And the ideas you can't remember aren't good enough. They might be good tomorrow when they're been maturing and you want to test them again, but you really have to be simple and clear in, your, in the way you explain stuff. The best example was this, the Thai students who managed four people at the same time to draw the same drawing. That, that's just uh, ballet for architects, really in, impressive stuff. So the experience of lifting the construction you've designed yourself, that sticks with you. And the embarrassment of not thinking about the section when you design the fence and you realize you can't get it to the site when it's done, that's all, it sort of sticks with you. And of course, kids bathing in concrete water is not the safest. So you have a completely different set of tools and reaction to your design that you bring back and you think about different aspects of your own work. Health and safety, maybe not the best way, way to do it. So I'll show you a time lapse of this process. It, it explains this more than I can do.
So that was the whole process before and after. Uh, the build was three weeks, almost two and a half weeks. <coughs> um, it's quite basic. We, we had to do a extra re reinforcement under the building because the concrete was really poor. Um, that became the foundation for the whole design, basically. And then we took the longest pieces of wood we can find, and that gave the height of the roof. So it's, it's almost not design. It's like um, uh, just taking whatever framework you have and try to make architecture of it. So it's an interesting way of working. As you see, the space is quite limited. But we wanted to give the building some depth, because even though we took some space from the f playing field, we gave the kids that don't want to play football uh, a chance to have a place to do homework or sit down and talk and do sort of the more softer games. It, it's a rough neighborhood, and there's never a place to relax in a way. So that was the last project we did in Bangkok. Um, now we are moving into um, sort of a different, I guess, a different project. Uh, it's the last project we did, and we finished it in Oct October last year. Yeah, we have three people that we were here uh, and building this thing here. That's really cool. And even Zifeng that made the video. So. If you need a good video guy, go to him. <laughs> um, we did this uh, exhibition in, in France uh, presenting our projects. And as I said, small opportunities arise, or big opportunities arise from small circumstances. Um, actually, the father-in-law of the next client saw our projects here. He's, from, he's a French guy. And then he called his son-in-law and said, well, you should take a look at these guys. They, they might fit well with your project. The client is uh, working in Sumatra, which is actually the, the capital of, of cinnamon, uh, or cassia, as it's called in the local language. Uh, I think it's 85% of all the cinnamon we use in the world comes from this area. Actually, it comes from the forest we were situated in. And cinnamon is, uh, as you might know, the bark of the cinnamon tree. And uh, the way they do it, they chop down the tree and they take off the bark. Uh, and then they dry it and sort it in different qualities and all this industrial stuff. And as in many other poor countries, the, the, the working conditions of the workers are quite uh, horrific. Um, they work in very dusty environments. They have no safety gear and uh, very little pay, of course. And our client really wanted to do something about this. He wanted to make a place where the workers could be part of how the, the company was developed. This is, I should have sound for this, because the sound there is crazy. These machines go and crush, and it, it sounds really, really crazy. And I, I usually say that it might smell like Christmas, but it doesn't feel like it. <coughs> One thing that is cool about this project for us is that we've managed to take the good parts from all our projects and sort of combine them into one. And one of the things we've learned is that building the team is actually really important for the design phase because you really have to have good people working there. Um, in this picture, you see Ploy from the old projects in Thailand. We brought her in just because she's a great architect, great friend. She knows stuff we don't. We have some architects from that was representing the sponsors that was uh, paying for the project. In, uh, and then you also have some students, which are actually also both here, uh, which is cool. Um, some interpreters. The old guy is the father-in-law, and the guy with the glasses is the client. Looks a bit mafia, but he's, he's really a great guy. Yeah, and the last guy, the guy with, with the sort of yellowy shirt, um, he lives on the site, and he runs the sawmill on the site, and he knows everyone. And sometimes you just meet this guy, the go-to guy. He can fix anything. 
And his motto was, no problem. We love that guy. He, he made the whole project happen. Really cool. So this is basically how a usual sketch looks like. Um, sometimes even we can't d decipher what it's supposed to mean. Uh, basically, it's a big site. The, the sea is this way. There's a road passing by. Uh, the site is 60 by 120 meters. And the client wanted to have a full processing plant. The problem is that w with us was that we had five weeks left to build when, when we were getting close to, uh, the, close to the design finished. And we realized we, we don't really have time for this. We did a lot of testing about what we wanted, social spaces, how do you meet, how do you let rich customers and poor farmers meet and have a mutual understanding of what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, here's the cinnamon being dried along the road in Sumatra. What is cool is this is the sawmill next to the site uh, where our guy was uh, making the timber. And what you get when you take the bark off the cinnamon trees is big trunks of wood. And because it's usually used in a way that makes it it's vulnerable to rot and these things if you do it in the wrong way. And, and the social stigma of the, the wood is, is quite bad. You shouldn't use that wood. It's cheap and it's sort of trash. Uh, but there is no apparent reason why they don't use it if they do it in the proper way. So we wanted, it was just logical. You take the timber, you cut it, and then you build with it. It made sense in a way. And then also the local uh, area made these brick, bricks. It's a very clayey area, so they, they have a lot of brickwork. These are burnt uh, for three or four kilometers from the site. Really, We talked about it in the introduction that we got the question, if we actually focus on sustainability and all these environmental uh, issues of architecture, and we really don't. It just comes, becomes a part of how we design because we have to. There's no reason going to a site that's 10 hours away if we can get nice bricks from the local market. And then we also found this quite interesting uh, handy craft in the area that we wanted to use. <coughs> this is basically the sketch we landed on. Uh, it's not very magical. It's sort of a base with heavy functions, a bit like the bathhouse in, in Thailand, I guess. And then it's sort of a forest of cinnamon trees with a big, big roof on top. We did some testing uh, prototypes and models. Nothing fancy, but it makes you understand what you can achieve with what you have. And then, of course, it develops from there. This is probably the amount of detail we had before we started building. We do quite a lot of uh, on-site uh, testing. One-to-one -one testing is quite useful to see sort of how, how does this actually feel, it's sort of the dimensions of stuff. And when you can touch the piece of wood and sort of really show how we're supposed to do this, it's so much easier to explain what you're trying to do in less time and with less words and basically no drawings. Maybe that might be a good idea to have some drawings. But we manage mostly without, actually. The bad part with this project, we wanted to have more time. Uh, and when we came, the Ramadan was going on. And as you know, in Ramadan, you're not supposed to eat from sun up to sun down. Um, and that made all the workers quite uh, sort of woozy, and uh, they couldn't really work. They couldn't even drink water. And of course, as you imagine, it didn't really work. So we wanted, we, had, we actually wanted to start building, but they, want, they had to have two weeks of almost vacation because they were so tired. And then finally, when Ramadan was over, uh, they had one week of celebrating because they were eating again. So then we lost another week. And we had to really push to get this done. And I guess we realized in the end now this is, we should probably have uh, understood this earlier, but we've seen that we should probably have had more time on this project. Everything was quite crazy. 
the good part is of getting the construction up as you're doing the casting and the bricklaying is that you can work in layers. So suddenly we have three stories in running at the same time. So I'll do the same. I have a time lapse of this project. And we built this in five weeks. And I think I lost two pounds a week. It was not something that would be recommended.
Joy Wen, located in the star system Suna, and I've come to your planet to partake in matters of a sexual nature with the females of your species. And I would like to begin with you, and I believe her. It's a training center for the farmers. So it's basically the, it's the administrative part of the program. It, it ended up, as I said, being quite a big thing. It, the whole facility will be about 2,000 square meters uh, when it's finished. And we didn't have time to build 2,000 square meters naturally. So we did the, sort of the head piece of the whole thing. We did the administration office where you you bring in customers to show how the production is done, and you also bring in farmers to have um, workshops on sustainable farming, uh, training them in understanding how the market works, and then also why they have to invest in their crops. Because, of course, growing trees as a way of living is quite slow kind of income. So after 15 years, you might profit from it. And um, cinnamon business is quite volatile, so they end up chopping down cinnamon to do corn because of maybe biodiesel or whatever. And then you have to think 15 years ahead. And with limited resources, that's quite complicated. So uh, training the farmer, farmers in understanding this kind of process is quite important. You can, uh, the plan is quite simple. You have a main entrance over here. So you enter through this uh, pathway to the main showroom, which is the bi biggest room. Uh, you have a kitchen and uh, eating area outside under the roof, a lab laboratory to test the cinnamon quality, workshop area, classrooms, uh, offices towards the road and the view, and then two toilets and a guardhouse. This is a section. What's really cool is that uh, uh, this time the, the team grew quite dramatically. We had 10 in our team and then 70 local workers. Um, the good part is, as I said, we, we sort of picked out the good parts of our projects and this time the difference in temperature outside and inside is really, really great. You can come from the outside hot and humid and horrible and then as, uh, at the moment you step under the roof, it's cold. It's on the border being too cold because the ventilation really pulls the air out of the buildings. And this, the, the size of the roof and then the volume of the, the brick buildings are really working in a good way. This is the back of the building with the view towards the sea. Sorry, the lake. Very big lake in the middle of Sumatra. And this is the front. It's the entrance with the guardhouse, and uh, you can see the logo of the company on the door 
for the main showroom. It's also the first time we've had a scale buffalo in our, in our projects. All the doors and windows are made by local carpenters. And it was quite cool because we had to give them the drawings before we knew where the door was going. So we just gave them a sort of a schematic of a door. And then when they came, we sort of, OK, it could be go. It, this one can go there. And we had a limited number of windows. So the design was sort of, I wouldn't say forced, but it, it happens as you go. The first, the day we cleaned up everything, I was taking pictures. Uh, I, I, a good friend, Pasi Alto, is an architect and photographer. He came down to Sumatra to help us take some pictures. And this family came by, and the first thing one said was, ooh, hotel? So they, I think we sort of raised the le level of what the administration office can look like. So this is from the inside of the lab before furnishing it. This is the main showroom. I'm going to end with a quote from Johanne Palasma, which really rings true to what we're trying to work with. Architecture is about the understanding of the world and turning it into a more meaningful and humane place. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, now, open it up to the floor if anyone has any questions. Um, what are your plans for the future? I mean, do you kind of plan to expand it more, have more work, like instead of focusing on small scale individual projects, maybe doing more than one at the same time? Or That's a very good question, and uh, I actually don't know. Uh, we're in a moment or period of change in team and uh, our biggest problem is actually not only that we can't make a living of this because of course it's hard to make money from this kind of mm, kinds of projects the biggest problem is actually that we are so expensive because we're from Norway and we're anywhere in Europe so the level of what you use for the architect and the people involved is higher than the cost of the building and as you've seen, the, the, the smallest projects have been uh, cost less than hiring me for a week, in a way. So it, it doesn't add up and flying everywhere. And so I think what we're trying to do is support student groups in doing the same. I think that's a very good way to, do, uh, to go. And we're also building up something in Norway, which might be uh, building on the ideas and the methods we use abroad or wherever, and then trying to use the same kind of uh, approach in Norway. So both I don't know and yes we have plans for the future. I, I just, yeah. Hi, um, sorry uh, I arrived a little bit late so I hope the question's still relevant. Um, I'm just quite very interested in how you made that transition. You said after you went back and you did your masters and then coming back as an architect um, how did you go back into doing it after having taken the break to finish your masters and how did that affect things and also I'm um, very interested in where the funding comes from <laughs> yes. yes um the transition uh we have to what is good with the way we work or have been working try to keep on working is that we we don't we don't do tips and tricks in a way it's not like you can get a f really good idea. As my teacher said, ideas you can get cheaply. It's, it's sort of the mindset and how you approach stuff that's important. And w one of our approaches is always changing direction all the time. If, if we think something is bad, we, we turn. And if it's good, we go for it. And then we change it to the better as, as much as possible. Um, and we've tried to find channels to work in the same way. So we have a small position at our university, uh, guiding other student groups, as I said. And we also want to do workshops in the future, and I'm sure. Um, and we also have an agreement with one of our sponsors now. So we have a sponsor in Norway, which pays for building costs and these things. 
Um, and we are also working for them part time, which sort of adds up in a way because we can maybe apply some of our ideas into their their studio, and then they can give some of their excess money to building cool stuff, which they I, I guess they benefit from it too in both publicity and sort of the social uh, stamp they have. Yeah, but it's funding is is a big issue, of course, and as I said finding a level of how much we should use on doing this and how much um, is it worth it in a way the value of the project and the ripple effects is that is that worth it it is a constant battle of of uh, the idea of the whole thing and and making it rational in a way uh, i'm i'm sure it's not the impression you mean to give but there is a kind of effect, received effect, that kind of the Indonesians and the Thais are sort of waiting for a Western architect to come along and teach them how to build a house. Um, now, I understand that what you brought into the project was money. And I presume without that money, things like the playground wouldn't have got built. But do you think you brought anything more into the finished result than could have been achieved by local architects. And it brings me on to the second leg of the point, really, is the issue isn't really, as we, we're sort of discussing here, whether we can kind of raise enough money to go out there and build houses and playgrounds for people who can't do it for themselves. They can. They, they don't need people like you, I'm sure. I mean, I've traveled in the area, so mm. I, I do understand something about it. They don't need us. Now, I understand it's a marvelous teaching project for you. But can you say that you brought something to the project more than money, that we could justify our, in, our, our uh, continuing involvement? That is a very, also a very good question. I'm, I'm asking myself that all the time. And it's, it's partly also why we are in doubt if we should do this. I'm, I'm quite sure the value um, the biggest value for me, as I see it now on this old project, is, is the way it inspires other students to think differently, even though they might not go to Thailand. They might not go to anywhere in Africa or any poor country. They, they might even do it here, like, like uh, uh, this community cluster thing going on here. It's, it's in the streets of London. And it's based on the same principles, which is listening, sort of bringing the human being into the project and making that the focus focus that, that's uh, I think that's quite in interesting and um, for the if we're bringing something else I'm, I'm sure also we we have sort of a foreign we are foreign but we have also uh, maybe a different look on things when we meet them we can have a fresh look at stuff and as I said the combination of us trying to do something with bamboo on the one side and um, the local workers knowing skills of bamboo, they would never have clad these buildings this way. They have a different way of doing it. But we found fences in the area, and we wanted it to, to be this way because it felt more rigid or whatever you, uh, you can pull technical stuff or social or aesthetical stuff out of it, I guess. Um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Um, I don't think I'll find the answer, really, at least not now. <laughs> mm. I think there is value except bringing money. And as you've seen, uh, the project hasn't been expensive at all in a way. So uh, we've tried to make sure that we use materials most people can afford. And as you say, they can do this. And in the, let's say, in the, the first uh, community center in Bangkok, they did do it themselves. And one of the workers came and was angry with us because now his wife wanted a second story. <laughs> and it's like, they have ripple effects and we don't know them now, but I'm sure it's gonna be, well, I can say I'm sure it's gonna be valuable, but I hope they will be valuable for someone somewhere. At least, I guess that's, that's all, it's allowed to have a hope of it. <coughs> I think 
uh, I'm sorry, this is, a very, very prosaic, so. this is a very prosaic point. You seem to choose relatively flat roofs, uh, and sort of marginally sloping roofs, in an environment which tends almost to cry out for quite, quite sharply for sloping yeah. roofs, because it, it can rain a hell of a lot there and a hell of a hard. I was just curious as to why you made such a choice. Yeah, actually, uh, that's, a, that's a good point, uh, the shape of the roof. The first project, I can agree that we made the choice of having sort of a fancy shape of the roof. And we also got this in our examination that this looks like a Western design put into a Thai culture. Uh, however, our professor put it in a different way. He said that these houses are now part of Thai architect history. It's not Norwegian architect history because it's there. It's sort of it's in the community in Thailand. So that's, that's one side. The, the flat roof in, in the Kasia administry, the, the training center, is interesting because that was limited by the length of the wood. And we really wanted more of a slant on the roof, but it was basically not possible with the materials we had. Then we'd have to change the whole thing, and then time comes into play, and money, and you know, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, I'm sure we bring stuff that's not necessary for the practical use of the building. But I see that quite a lot in most architect architecture, even in, in Europe. Yeah. So, sorry, we had a question here in the front. Uh, I was just, no, just thinking. You talked about the value. I think the value is in both for you and for them. It's for, the f it's for both cultures. It's not only for one. I mean, the world is getting so small, we all interweaving each other and it's you know and these wonderful ideas from one to the other I think is great because this is how you learn this is how you develop this is how you move and that I think is interesting not what the buildings come out yeah I can agree with that and I've become less and less interested in in form and we, we often get sort of comments on the shape of the buildings and it's never really been a point for us that's more of a thing you do in a way and, and uh, also a sort of a nice story that's it might at least uh, give an example or be a metaphor of the way we work is that we learned this technique of cutting these tin roof sh uh, metal sheet roofs in Thailand by one of our workers there and it's very easy to just make a small incision in the, uh, in the, in the edge and then you just rip the whole thing in, in two. Uh, and then I went to Uganda to do my masters and I showed this to one of the kids, the kids we were working with and the next day he came to me and showed me if you, if you make a line first and then you could actually steer the cut in the shape you want it to be. And I was, we were struggling with that in Thailand. And apparent, uh, suddenly I realized that I had gone to Thailand, brought a small idea, brought it to Uganda, and there it was perfected or developed. developed. That's right. And for me that's sort of like a, it makes a significant difference in, in because then suddenly things are connected. And this is the way I guess societies are built. Yeah, this, is, this point I think is the important point of the whole thing actually. Mm. It's that. Yeah, I, I hope it's important. And I also see that when students pick up these things, I started out as a student as, as you've seen and I learned the way to approach stuff by mainly Samir Intala and, and our professor Hans Scotta, which are great people and I get inspired by them. And then I hope I might inspire someone to do something in a different way, I guess. So it's, it's hard to know the result of what we do now, but I'm, I'm sure at least something will come of it. Um, have you thought about ways that, more specifically, how this might be applied in the, uh, the West, in the developed world around us? Uh, as a model, do you know? Have you thought about how you could apply it here or in Norway or uh, in places more nearby? We have, yes, we have well thought about it. Yeah. Um, the tricky part is, of course, that uh, we have a lot of uh, administration and sort of bureaucracy you have to go through to, to get to where you are. But we have also seen that in the projects we have been involved in in Norway, uh, the connection between the architect and the engineer and the builder and the client is really, there's no flow of communication. It's very through channels, 
Like you go to this guy, he calls this guy, and then you order. If there's a problem, it's like, eh, it's not my responsibility, and that's sort of how you try to, you try to avoid being in charge of stuff. And for me, I think, as an architect, you have a uh, quite rare opportunity to connect these dots just by being a bit more socially, socially involved in your own project. Of course, it's hard in really big scale stuff because then things are moving so fast and there's so much at stake, but I'm, I'm sure it's possible to apply some of the more social or consciousness to the process. And as uh, we had this conversation with some students in Senegal uh, where Yashar, uh, I started laughing because it seemed quite stupid. He said that what's not built is not built. And I think that's a very good thing that we can bring here. Because what we do here is that we make concepts and then we send them to the government and they approve them. And then we work with the concept and make drawings that might be applied in this government uh, sort of part. And then, and then you start building it. And then it's too late to change anything, even though it's a good idea to change it. So it, it, I'm sure it could be possible to think more rationally throughout the process. It seems a bit rigid now, at least in Norway. So I guess that's, that's, that could be one of the most important parts, daring to change when there's reason to change. Uh, hi, um, congratulations for the presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I want to know what do you think about your uh, architectural education in the undergraduate with this kind of experience? Because I have been, for example, uh, involved in kind of similar projects, and I think that could it's very, very important in my experience. And it, it is, it's something that is not really teach at universities. But if you had, it's very good. So what do you, f what do you feel about that? Do you really think that this experience is important for your architectural practice? Yes, I think it's crucial. I think I wouldn't have been, mm, I wouldn't have been who I am today. But I, of course, that happens to everyone. It's like if you go into books, you, you become learned. <laughs> so it, it's related, I guess. I like building. And I've always liked building. Uh, our university is actually quite a building university. The first project we do in the first grade is to build a design. So, uh, uh, and they're quite liberal. You're allowed to do whatever you like. Um, the, the problem there is they don't take responsibility and, and, unless they see it's going to succeed. And I think that's one of the things that I, I would I would wish that uh, the universities um, had the courage to support students that did things that might fail. Because you shouldn't only do what you're, you shouldn't be driven by fear of failing. You should be driven by the sort of the, the will to succeed. And if you're always afraid of, no, if I fail, I'll actually fail and I have to redo my year or whatever. Uh, maybe not the most creative and developing way of working. Um, we are trying to get more workshops into Antenu and our university. And um, I guess Norway is a build it, do it yourself kind of country. Um, but what we've seen the last couple of years in our university is that the student initiatives are the best projects. And in a way, I, if I went back to being a student, I wouldn't wait for the university to be allowed to do what I want to do. Uh, we didn't know we would pass when we went to Thailand. We didn't even know if they would approve us going there. So, but I guess you should do it anyway. <laughs> There's someone in the back there. Hi. Oh, <laughs> um, can I just ask um, how you managed to move from the boat to finding the place in um, Thailand? So, like, how did you go about? Um, finding the community and all the stuff that's involved with that? Uh, it's all very coincidental in a way. Uh, one thing happens and then you react to it and then the next thing happens. Uh, what I've seen is that, and we also talk quite a lot about this, is that um, the key to success in, in many situations is, situation is to 
not only discover opportunities, but grasp them when you have the chance. And as I said, going from the boat, um, we talked about wanting to do build, build something. Then we talked to this guy and the cousin of a friend of a cousin. And he said, I'm in Thailand. I want to build stuff, but I don't have uh, the resources to do it. I, I'm not an architect. And then we thought, hmm, let's go there and see what happens. The first thing we did was buy a plot of land, and it cost like 5,000 British pounds. And when we came there, after one week, we saw that we can't use this plot. It's, it's useless. So we had to sell it. We lost 2,000 pounds, and, and uh, we sort of made all the worst mistakes the first week. And then we changed the site. We changed the program. We started doing different stuff. And we were supposed to be there one year doing the first project. And we ended up doing four projects just by seeing opportunity and just going for them in a way. Now it seems very linear, but of course it's, it's totally <laughs> random sometimes. We've been to some weird places and not been <laughs> able to get anything out of it, of course. It, it happens. Um, but I think, as I said earlier, we, we, have been, we have been daring in. When we feel like we should change direction, we have changed direction. And I think that's um, an underestimated value of uh, being in the process and being able to shift quite rapidly. Hello. I, th I think there's Is one this OK, first here and then. OK. Uh, it seemed to me that in the orphanage project, you decided to work on that project because you, s you observed this, uh, the need from the owner. Uh, do you think uh, that kind of volunteer volunteering from architect architects in general should be more common or should be something <coughs> um, more general, uh, a more general attitude to, to the, as a way of spreading um, this know-how we might have f uh, in response to, to actual needs? As a yeah, I, I think that is sort of a yes and a no. That the problem is, of course, as we've talked about, the amount of resources that's taken by us. Like, you shouldn't go in somewhere, try to be kind, and eat all their food and leave. It's sort of, you can really do this in a poor way. Uh, what I think is that it's stupid that teachers design schools and doctors design hospitals. There's some kind of disconnect in a lot of the development projects that are going on. And uh, planners are absolutely needed. Maybe not uh, builders like us, but planners and, sure, builders too. But um, I, think, I think architects can be useful in a lot of processes that we are not usually seen as useful in. And that's talking about working with project management, uh, process management, um, resource management. We have a different way of thinking about how to solve a problem, and I think I, I, that's really useful outside just design and houses. Um, so yes, I, I think we should get involved in social issues. Um, I guess we have to. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a, a wonderful and inspiring talk. Um, I was just going to ask about uh, your definition of necessity, um, because it was in your title. Um, and basically, I was wondering how much persuasion you have to do when it comes to speaking to a client or speaking to a sponsor or speaking to a community about... Basically, this pertains to the quote that you've got up and that has just vanished. <laughs> <laughs> the Palasma quote about the humane and meaningful place. Um, and very often that comes from the architect knowing what a meaningful place could be. Mm. And that's something that a builder can't really do traditionally. The architect needs that foresight. And very often in this country, in my very limited experience, that foresight is overshadowed by the bureaucracy that you mentioned before and the fact that authorities and the planners don't really see something as being necessary or seeing it as a, they see it as a distraction. So really my point to you is how much persuasion do you have to do in these far-flung uh, areas. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, no project is alike, and it's not been for us either. The, um, like in, in Sumatra, the, the client just gave us 
free reigns and we were in charge of everything and he just left basically and came back when it was done. Um, um, that is risky of course. Uh, but it's, you don't have to, I, I guess you don't have to convince the clients when you're working with a group of kids in, in, in the slums of Bangkok to that they they need a sort of attic space. I don't know, it's, it's that's a tricky, I don't know how I, I could answer that. Um, also the, the word necessity for us, it's, it's a lot about if you figure out designs that demands extra effort and extra materials and your own ego sort of overshadows the need for a function, or, um, then it becomes a bit silly. However, we have also had a Norwegian lecture and uh, the title is Necessary Aesthetics, um, which I think relates to that quite well because uh, one can say that, could say that um, the projects look too nice to be humanitarian or whatever. They're supposed to look like shacks and simple basic houses. But the value of beauty is, is too rich to understand in a limited way, I think. And, and um, I probably find other stuff beautiful in the projects than you might, or even the clients, of course. Um, so for us, the, sh the sort of the, the touch, the feel of the project and the look of the project and the, the smell of it, it's all connected with also necessary aesthetics. It should look and feel good. Uh, and why not look and feel good for people that can't, they don't have the resources in the first place. Um, I guess it's, it's sort of the, the universal term of aesthetics, which is quite difficult to grasp, I guess. Um, it's a tricky one. Necessity. I think, I think often one professor in our school had a wonderful saying. He always said, don't design your own problems. And we do that all the time. It's like we have these ideas. And then we're struggling with, like, I can't make this work. And you've done it yourself. You sort of you made the plan. You've tried this kind of ceiling. It, it's silly. Well, why use resources if you've done, you made the problem yourself? And I, that's also part of the necessity term is that don't put stuff there that's not necessary. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean just to make uh, anemic, boring, plain houses. Just don't do stupid, <laughs> unnecessary stuff. <laughs> There's maybe not that much poetry to it, but. I think that's all we have time for, but thank you so much. That was very inspiring, and we really hope we can carry on the conversation. Thank you very much.